Well, welcome to another episode of The Conversation, a place where we attempt to tackle issues particularly related to race and racism in and around Falmouth and in the society at large. I'm Will Mebbin, and I have the privilege of serving as co-host and co-producer of this series, along with the newly elected member of the Falmouth Select Board, my friend, for which is an honor to be in her presence, the Honorable Angela Scott Price. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> Thanks, Ren. We're so proud of you, Angie, and know that you're going to do great work for the people in the town of Falmouth, and uh, just so delighted for you. Thanks, Ren. Our show today is going to be on justice, uh, specifically in looking at um, what are the roots, root causes of racism in our justice system, and then we'll talk about uh, to tackle another question, which is how do we eradicate racism in our justice system? We have a distinguished uh, group of panelists who are going to join us, but first, we're going to hear from some prominent individuals in the Falmouth community on what they have to say about why there is racism, what are the root causes of racism, racism in our criminal justice system. If you had asked me a year ago yesterday, uh, I would have said that I didn't think there was racism uh, in the criminal justice system. You know, I thought there were bigots, I thought there were sporadic miscreants, but, uh, but nothing as uh, institutional as, uh, as we've come to learn as a result of the murder of George Floyd, the issues with Breonna Taylor and Eric Garner. Uh, kind of forced us to uh, put a mirror on ourselves and, and confront the history of uh, racial uh, injustice in, in this country. So, I mean, as the root causes go back, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400 years, if you look at the 1619 project uh, that the New York Times is working on. Um, I think the root causes in the justice system are the same causes that are in the population or in our whole society. There's no difference that we live, we're born into a system of oppression, racism, and it goes beyond classism, all of that. We live in that. It's hard. We swim in it. <laughs> so it's really hard to notice. Um, but when I, when I started opening my eyes, I started to realize in Falmouth, we've become a more... Uh, segregated society than when I grew up here in the 50s. Um, and we don't have the same opportunities to interact um, with people of color, indigenous people. We just live su such segregated lives. It's the same root cause. The people in power at the time wrote the laws, wrote the policies, wrote the procedures, wrote the regulations to benefit the majority, to benefit the men in power. And on, uh, as we all know, um, that's the root cause of racism. It's, it's othering. It's othering. And it's been going on for a very, very, very long time. Nothing secret about that. Well, welcome back to the conversation. We just heard from uh, three very prominent individuals in the town of Falmouth sharing their thoughts about the roots for racism, uh, roots of racism in the justice system. We're joined now by two individuals as part of our panel. Uh, soon we'll be able to be doing this uh, actually in studio. Now we're still having to do it via Zoom because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but grateful for your presence with us today. So uh, let me ask you, uh, Miranda, I'm going to start with you. Miranda is a co-founder of uh, Cape Cod Voices, or Voices of Cape Cod, 
and um, as I understand, founded that with your sister, Chandler. And uh, why don't you, first of all, tell us a little bit about uh, your organization and the sort of work in which you're involved. Um, yeah, so Cape Cod Voices is a community organization dedicated to bringing black and brown voices to the center of the conversation of race, um, educate and combat issues of systemic and institutional racism, and advocate for students um, a color in our schools here locally on Cape Cod. So a lot of the work we do right now does focus in schools. Um, and we offer professional development for teachers. Um, we also do uh, anti-racism consulting. So, and how long has the organization existed? So we are almost one years old. Um, we right. sort of started, yeah, around midsummer last year. And was that in response to the activities of last summer? How did uh, the idea come about to start mm -hmm. the organization? Yeah, so um, it was in response. Um, being here, we don't do a lot of work in our group at this point with um, the criminal justice system, but it is some, a really important topic for us. Um, last year, my sister and I started doing local, going to local protests around Cape Cod in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. And we were at one in Hyannis where there was an overwhelming message that really racism doesn't exist here on Cape Cod. Um, and it was very infuriating for us as well because this is, we have a kind of like a personal side when it comes to that story. Um, we were actually like around about a mile away where our own uncle who had experienced police brutality, um, where he had experienced the police brutality. Um, so it was definitely something like, how could racism not exist on Cape Cod when I know it happened here um, kind of thing. Or, you know, and I think that being a person of color on Cape Cod in general, you just know what happens here. Yeah, well, I know you, um, as I understand it, you live in Falmouth, right? And uh, your sister has lived in Falmouth as well. So based upon what you saw uh, in the responses from our people on the street, uh, what's, your, what's your reaction to what they had to say? Do you agree with what they were saying? Do you disagree? What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I think there were some good points. Um, but I think there was, in general, what was missing was, I guess, the, when I think about the criminal justice system and its origins, the roots, I would go back to, you. I feel like you can't talk about it without discussing America's legacy of slavery. Um, you can't talk about it without thinking about the role that capitalism played as well. Um, obviously we think about the 13th amendment where um, after slavery was ended, it said that there would be no servitude unless someone was held as a criminal. Um, and I think that is, slavery was a economic advantage for men and white men, specifically who owned plantations. And in order to encourage, to maintain that economic advantage, that power, we had the 13th Amendment and it eventually, I guess, became what we know today as the criminal justice system in a lot of ways. And I think that's something really important to be aware of and understand. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, you're mentioning uh, slavery and the connection with uh, the justice system and slavery uh, leads me to you, to you, Robert. I know you uh, served for many years as a uh, deputy in the sheriff's uh, office in Fairfax County, Virginia. And uh, when I think about, we're just following up on what Miranda was saying, I think about the connection with slavery, I, I think about the uh, slave patrols that uh, preceded the formation of what we have today as uh, police officers, police right. departments. Uh, so glad to have you as part of the panel today as well, Robert, and give us your reaction to what you just heard from the people on the street. Oh yes, um, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, definitely. They hit some good points about that. Uh, Miss Al's definitely brought up some great points there. Um, as we know, it, the bias has always been, you know, um, the criminal justice system. So many flaws, so many, so many problems. 
when you're poor, person of color, uh, it's been embedded psychologically in the minds of judges, prosecutors, uh, just different areas where people of color are always going to be on the short end. And when you come back to slavery, it's always been fear has always controlled us, the generations. And, and when you get in the justice system, the fear of staying in jail, losing your family, we, we find that people of color will admit the things they didn't even do. I, I was in the jail system for 30 years and I watched individuals who would basically confess the things just to get out of jail. You know, because they didn't have the money for bail, they didn't have certain, you know, things. So I know that, but the the, uh, the street people that they would, you know, pretty much on point on my, you know, you know, what I thought and what I heard. And Miss Alice definitely uh, hit the, uh, I didn't even think about the slavery part, but that was a great point she brought up. Well, there's been a lot of discussion uh, recently about bail. You brought that up, Robert, and mm-hmm. how our bail system uh, criminalizes individuals before they even have a chance to be uh, brought to court and to have their, their cases heard. And if you are a person uh, without means, if you live in poverty, uh, the bail system is uh, can be very oppressive. Um, and so you have to languish in, in jail. And, you know, I could see how a person that's in that kind of situation would uh, decide that, uh, you know, I want to get out of here. And so if they want me to uh, admit to something I didn't do, uh, you know, I'm going to do it so I can get home and I can see my family and be right. with my children and my, my spouse, my partner, my, uh, my friends and what have you. So uh, I've been learning recently how oppressive the bail system in this, in this uh, country uh, really is. So, Anji, uh, we're newly elected uh, member of the select board of Falmouth, the honorable one. Uh, what are you thinking in response to what either Miranda, Robert, or our people on the street, Brenda and Robert and Nell, had to say? Yeah, well, I think I'm going to point out that Miranda had a very, very good point about the history of our justice system. And we quite often talk about the just the now um, and what's happening now, what's in front of us. But I think it's really important to talk about the history and how we got to where we are. We can't talk about our justice system reform without understanding where it came from, just like with, with anything, which we talk about quite a bit on this show is understanding the history of where some of these issues come from so we can understand how to move forward. So I think um, that is an incredibly powerful concept for us to be thinking about the history of it. And so, um, I do agree that with most of what was said on the street, but I think that's an important component if if we are gonna move forward in in this discussion, thinking about um, the context and the framing of of our system and why it is the way it is, you know, why is our system so much different than other countries? I think it was Brenda who mentioned that we have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of those incarcerated and You can't understand how we got to that without understanding the history of of the slavery and the capitalism, as Miranda mentioned. So I think that was incredibly spot on. Well, I I also wanted to respond to what uh, I think was uh, Robert Mascali said. He was uh, he was being honest, which I really appreciated uh, about how he had not thought about there being racism in the uh, uh, criminal justice system that he has operated under the understanding that uh, there was no racism in the system. but it, And it wasn't until last summer, uh, following, uh, he mentioned uh, the murder of George Floyd, the, uh, the killing of Breonna Taylor, and then he went back and talked about, I believe, uh, the lynching, I would call it, of Aaron Garner, mm-hmm. that those things began to make him realize that, wait a minute, there's something there's something not right here. Something's wrong here. And, you know, Miranda, you said that that was um, that sort of reckoning that was going on in the country almost a year ago. Here we are doing this show uh, just days after the country acknowledged the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. 
that your sister and, and you and, and others uh, were motivated to uh, do something as a result of the reckoning that was taking place. But Robert, I want to ask you, because you had um, many years as a deputy sheriff, and uh, so you've been steeped in the uh, justice system. Uh, share with us, if you would, some of the experiences that you had, some of the things you witnessed as a uh, sworn peace officer and that sort of illustrate the existence of racism in our justice system? Oh, wow. Uh, joining the force in 1985 in Fairfax, Virginia, just off the bat of just taking a tour to courthouse alone, and they point out to you that the, the cannons out front of the courthouse are still pointed towards the north. And the road that runs through there is called Gallows Road, which is Fairfax Hospitals on there. And they would hang black people there, but they made a point to let us know that this road, Gallows Road, was where they hung black people. Mm -hmm. And even in my first days on the job, I'm watching deputies walking, driving in with Confederate flags on their trucks. I mean, I'm talking big flags, not small flags. And, I'm, and uh, I realized that I was in pretty much a hostile environment. <laughs> but this, you know, even speaking to the inmates and, you know, find out they're, they're there for maybe stealing a pizza and they got like a, a $5,000 bond, for, you know, for stealing a pizza. And then you you might see a white inmate who's in there for something else, his bond's a thousand or somebody gets released on the PR and somebody who can't is staying in jail. So there was always, there was always a sign of racism in there. Um, watching attorneys come in on Thursday night and somebody has court Friday, but hasn't seen that attorney for the whole month they've been in jail. But here he comes Thursday night to tell him to give him a plea deal. So, you know, he's getting, he's making $125 on the case. He's not making much. So then you see like the racism of, piling all these inmates in there the last minute and do you really feel they're getting the justice of representation from an attorney who's just telling them you know you're going to court tomorrow sorry I couldn't see you since you've been here for a month but we need to get this over with tomorrow because <laughs> he's only making like $125 per case which you know a public defender is not you know in most cases is not going to fight for you and the ones who can afford it have the attorney that comes visit them every week <laughs> or has them out. So, you know, I've seen a lot of injustice in that way of how the system works only for certain people, especially when, you know, we're locking up these young kids and their parents don't have no means of giving them great representation of the attorney. So they end up with a public defender who's gonna ask them to do a plea deal. So now they have a felony on their record they get out and then they can't get a job or the seven, you know, 19 years old and they already got a felony, you know, you know, based on their representation of the attorney. But, you know, I'll, you know, I'll also take it a fact, you know, they, they probably did the crime, but they didn't really get the great representation. They got like one hour of representation really of hearing their case. So that was one of the things that bothered me a lot as I, I worked there was just to see that happen every week. This uh, inmate's not really getting heard, you know, for their case the next day. So that was. Well, the example you offer brings us back to the question or the issue of, of economics, right? And uh, Miranda, I think you raised the, uh, the subject of capitalism and how that works against uh, individuals in the uh, justice system. And because if you got a public defender, you know, making $150 per case, then right, it becomes a numbers game for them. They just want to push the cases through so they can get that $125 and get on to the next one and, and make it up in volume as, as we say. But uh, I think Brenda in the um, opening response to the question about uh, the roots of racism in the criminal justice system. I think she said, you know, it has to do with um, 
it's just a reflection of society, right? So we have racism in society. And uh, so why would we not think that racism also exists in the uh, criminal justice system? And so Miranda, I know you are involved in uh, work combating racism all across the um, all of, across the society. So, what, what what did you think of that response from from Brenda? That it's just a reflection of society. Racism is in society, so of course it's going to be in the justice system. Yes, racism is definitely in society. Um, but I also think when it comes to the criminal justice system, it was designed to be racist in a way. Like it was very deliberate. Um, I think. In the beginning, again, when we talk about, you know, the 13th Amendment, arresting Black people for petty crimes, trying to get the work done still that, you know, wasn't being done after the slaves were freed. I think really there was this deliberateness that I think is really important to acknowledge when it comes to the criminal justice system. Um, and I do think, yes, we live in a, a very racist society. But I, and I think I, I once heard someone said to me, how did racism seep into our criminal justice system? And I was like, well, I mean, I, you know, I'm like, it wasn't, it was designed that way. It didn't seep in. But I do think that the racism that is, it was designed into our criminal justice system seeps out. And I do think that it affects other systems and it affects people. I was thinking a lot today about um, generational trauma and the physical changes that stress can create and the way that that can be passed down. Um, and, and I think a lot of it is when you, deliberately infuse or put racist, racist laws into practice, you're going to have that stretch out farther than you mean, I think. And I, so I do think it's something that it is all around us, um, but I don't, I don't think it's society happened. I, 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 think, I think it seeps out from the criminal justice system. It does affect other avenues of our society. Yeah, How about other system? Oh, sorry. No, I was to say that's that's a really good point. I'm thinking about what um, Robert just said about how you have in the in this example you have a, a young man who decides to plead to a crime that he didn't commit because he doesn't have the money to make bail, but it's a way for him to get out. And now he has that on his record forever. Mm -hmm. And so now that's another way that he can be discriminated against in the future without anyone ever understanding why he ever would have taken that plea in the first place. So I think the point of it seeps out, that is a perfect example of, of how that can happen and how it yeah, does right. happen. We know it happens. Yeah, I just believe it was just when they, this is just my belief on that type of action it was just to keep people of color down, to, to, to get you to, you know, the crime, have that felony, have that misdemeanor, it ruined your life. It can ruin your life forever. Mm. You know, and I think it was, you know, way back time, slavery time till now, is just a way to keep us down, oppressed in fear. Because I always say fear has controlled the world for, you know, for millions of years, but especially people of color, we fear. I mean, and, and, and the police have always, I, I always consider the police in some cases organized crime. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because of what I experienced myself at my job and, 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 and had to you know, file a $45 million suit you know, against them and, and won. But just the way they attack me is just, if they can attack me, this thing, what are they going to do to you? You know, I, and I worked in the system, but the system was going after me daily. So I know how they go after the civilian population. So I want to I want to hear more about the, your reference of uh, the police as organized crime. I want to I want to hear more about that. But I, I also and we want to talk about your 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 suit. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've been saying now for, for years is that we don't have a criminal justice system. We have a criminal injustice system, right? And, and it does begin, it's, it's like, I guess maybe this is what you were, you were saying, Robert, what do you think about this? That, this, that the racism that is in our 
criminal justice system is state sanctioned. It's state sponsored. It's mm -hmm. there because of the laws, the regulations, the rules that are then on the book. So say, say more about um, you are seeing um, forces as uh, criminal uh, police forces as organized crime. I look at it as always organized crime because of the blue line. You can see what's going on in Boston with the commissioner and what's going on there and how people would have been taught doing the investigation. The, the new mayor couldn't get doing the investigation. He couldn't get anybody to talk. And that's, you know, being a rat basically in law enforcement will ruin your career forever. And you don't want to cross that line. And I always look at it as organized crime. If you're a rat, what do they do? They, mm -hmm. take, they take you out. I mean, I had death. We had death threats. We had different things go on, you know, messages on our phones. I mean, different things. And the system just ignored it. You know, politicians ignored it. Uh, different things, different people, even groups like the NAACP ignored it. And so in national law enforcement, uh, black law enforcement, I mean, those different organizations just stayed away from us during that time. But I just know that in, when you're in law enforcement, you just don't cross the blue line. When you do, you, you're, you're pretty much a rat and no one wants to be with you. I work with 650 deputies. Fairfax is one of the largest sheriff's departments in Virginia. So when you have 98% of people don't want you there. <laughs> it, it can be very hard and it was very hard, but. Yeah, you know, that thin blue line, uh, which we know about and, mm. and, and you, you talk about officers not wanting to be a rat, you know, not wanting to, to use the street vernacular to be a snitch, right? Sure. It just struck me as I was listening to you, uh, how is that any different from uh, people in the community uh, who are witnesses to crimes, not wanting to snitch on mm. others who have committed the crime. So on the one hand, you've got law enforcement saying, oh, we need you to tell us, we need you to tell us, we need you to give us the truth, we need you to point the finger, you know, tell us who it was, mm. right? Yet, when the shoe's on the other foot, they don't want to. They don't want to tell what was going on, what was wrong. I mean, that just struck me as you as you were as you as you were talking. So tell yeah. us a bit more about about your. Uh, go ahead if you were in. No, it's to that. it's in law enforcement. It's us against them, and mm -hmm. then when it, when it comes down to it, same with the inmates. It's us against them. So same on the street. You know, people will call the police when they need them. But then when it's time to tell somebody, we don't like the police. You know, when, when your family member is being attacked or something, then you call 911. But then when they walk around and ask you, Have, did you see somebody shoot somebody? Or, oh, no, I don't see nothing. I was asleep. <laughs> and, I, and I always, when I hear that, it's like inmates will say, did you see the guys fighting? No, I was asleep. You know, I didn't see nothing. So the mentality of us against them, that's, that's been for years. It's uh, we've always been told from the beginning it's us against them, and that's. And in both of those cases, I guess that that grows out of fear. You mentioned fear earlier, so there's right. fear from uh, the uh, police officers that if they snitch on a fellow officer, that they're going to be ostracized. They're going to life is going to be difficult for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not get responses. I've heard officers say they may not get backup if they need backup. Uh, to a to a uh, to a scene or something because uh, mm. they're being being ostracized. Uh, so Serpico Serpico is like the number one. Anybody that's watched Serpico, that's that? that's what happened. Serpico, the movie. Serpico. Oh, you haven't seen that movie, Andre? No. Oh, oh you got to see that movie. Yeah, that's a oh. true story. <laughs> yeah, Miranda, have you seen that? Oh, see, we old guys. We got we got to educate the young ones here, Robert. <laughs> no, Al Pacino. Al Pacino played a police officer named uh, Serpico, who would not take was not on the take, and they 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 actually, you know, try to kill him. All right, so moving that at Rev's house is what I'm hearing. Right? Oh, there you go. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I haven't yeah. seen it in a while, so yeah, it's, a, uh, it's worth dialing up again. Right. Angie, let me toss it to you. See what you're thinking about. Oh, um, 
what am I thinking about? I've he- I have heard other people refer to police departments and police in general as organized crime for, for all of those reasons um, that, you know, you don't want to be ostracized and that if you are, you're, no, you're not going to be trusted anywhere afterwards. It's like, if you, you know, quote, rat on the police or snitch on the police, like you're not going to go work for the fire department or anywhere else. No one's going to, no one's going to trust you after that. Um, yeah, I know I had some other thoughts, but I feel like I want to pass it to Miranda and hear her. Yeah, thoughts. Miranda, what are you been sitting there for a while hearing this? What's uh, what's bubbling up for you? Oh, I've just, I've been thinking kind of how that type of, I guess, close knit culture might transfer into the rest of the criminal justice system. Um, I feel like there are times when maybe, you know, when we talk about police accountability or um, immunity, um, how this really plays out, I guess, on that larger scale. It's kind of what I've been thinking about. Um, Is that something that you noticed or? So I'll, I'll chime in real quick and say that um, I've talked about my dad a little bit before. He was an OBGYN, but he was also a lawyer. And he went back to school after being a doctor to become a lawyer because he saw um, a lot of malpractice suits and he wanted to be able to represent people. Um, And his favorite thing to do um, in the time that I spent with him was was to watch Law and Order. And I, when I was younger, I hated watching it with them because I'm like, but they, they always get their cases. They always get the bad guy. Like it's so lame. You always know what's going to happen. And, but they, I mean, they don't in the show. Um, But he told me, you know, there was some truth in that show and the way that the prosecutors, you know, come to the police departments and talk through strategies and talk through how, you know, they're going to work things in the courtroom and, Obviously, I know that that's fiction, that's television, but I, I do imagine that some of that close knit people outside of the courtroom translates to inside the courtroom. Like my friend said, he had other lawyer friends who, you know, they might be he, they might be prosecutors and he was, you know, for a defendant, but they were friends outside of the courtroom. And so they they would sometimes talk about things outside of court. And so I imagine that if you had to bigoted, disrespectful people who were on both sides of that, they might, you know, work on something outside of the courts and bring it into court. And so we all know that people have their biases anyway. And if you've got people like public defenders or, well, I don't, I don't want to talk bad about public defenders, but, you know, using them as an example, but, you know, if you have somebody who's a public defender already not being paid a lot, coming in with their biases and they're friends with the, the lawyer and they're coming in with their biases, like, you know, that could be a perfect storm for, for a lot of injustices to happen. And it would be perceived as part of the justice system because of what you see in court, but not really understanding what's happening outside of court. Right. Yeah, I think I definitely, I think I always call it, I guess, like implicit um, racism, kind of like ambiguous racism. And I think that happens a lot where uh, I think about my uncle's case, right? So he is a black man, a victim of police brutality. And he took um, the police officers that um, attacked him to court and they were acquitted. Um, but I do think about the things that happened throughout his trial and how things, you know, the, the biases that were introduced or, um, you know, you look at them specifically on this one scale in this one case and there are these, there's room for plausible deniability. But really what it is, is when you take all those cases together in an aggregate, that's when you start realizing there is that discrepancy. This is this might be something that's happening and it's something that we need to look at. And so it's, I, I guess it's, how do you connect that aggregate data set to what happens in real life? And I think that's something that's really important to think about. Yeah. yeah and sorry, jump in one more time. Um, something that you just said, Miranda, made me think about, um, you know, how black people, I'll talk about black people specifically are treated during a trial. So I don't know what happened in your uncle's trial, but I think about um, the George Chauvin trial recently and how so much was, um, brought up about George Floyd and his past and criminal past and whatever. And it was like, okay, but none of that had anything to do with the, that moment in time that we were you know, supposed to be talking about. And also that just adds to the bias of the people who are hearing about this trial. You know, none of, none of that matters. And even if any of that was relevant, does that give the police permission to murder someone? Like, do they get to be judge and jury because of somebody's past, but just the idea of, of bringing up all of those things from the past, um, you know, those, 
those add to the biases of the jury and of the judge. And, you know, if, if we go back to what we were talking about earlier in the conversation about how somebody might have at some point pleaded guilty to a crime that they didn't actually commit for the sake of, because they don't have bail. And now you have the second trial later on and somebody uses that without understanding, you know, that pass, it just compounds on itself and just increases the injustices. Yeah. I just want to make a point. If um, when I talk about the organized crime that this last week, I believe the family in Louisiana, the one that lost the police department tried to say the state troopers said th their son was killed in a car wreck. Yes. It yes. was two years, right. two years ago. I just wanted to, right. so you have to, they had body cams. So you have to figure for two years, how many people saw the body cam mm -hmm. and they kept it secret until now the, the department of justice is now investigating these different departments. So somebody might've got like, I think I better go ahead and release this somehow because I know they're gonna come here now, next. So I'm gonna be the guy that's gonna, or the girl and, and, and release the video camera. But you got your godfather up here, the chief had to know, or the state, you know, there's a lot of people that knew in that chain of command above those officers that this, their their report didn't match up to what the video camera, the, the body camera did, said. Right. And they kept it secret. So you've been you you've been as a as an officer. Uh, how many years did you serve as a correction uh, officer? I was thirty years and uh, and I did six years in the army as a military police. Uh, all right, so you wow. you've got a lot of experience. In, <laughs> yeah. in, uh, uh, so what what goes on in the in the locker room in the uh, in the bars? You know when the Everybody has everybody has something on someone. We know more about each other than people's wives and husbands know about each other. Mm -hmm. So if if one of these officers get in trouble, they're coming to their supervisor and say, you know, you remember me? You went out drinking one night and you might have committed adultery or something. And now they want to try to fire me. You think you can help me so your wife wasn't doesn't find out <laughs> well you know what i mean so i mean but it does happen i mean these yeah. these things you know they they hunt together they drink together they i always say officers and alcoholics they're drug acts i work with guys who are alcoholic and drug acts and but they always had something on somebody or they had family members who worked there in higher places so they were semi-protected mm. And once you shuffle one underneath the carpet, the next person's saying, well, you did it for Joe, so now you got to do it for me. Well, I'll tell on Joe. Right, so right. it's just a, it's a domino effect when people get in trouble. It's just because we all knew somebody did something criminally that could have been a mm -hmm. felony. Or, and so now, you know, they want to keep it hush-hush. So that's how, that's how this works until – like now the, the body cam comes out now. So now everybody's like, they're all running, like, you know, trying to get their story straight. <laughs> but uh, that's how it works. It's just somebody knows somebody about something about somebody and they just keep it in their back pocket till they need it. So we know the laws are, mm -hmm. are written. I think Reverend Nell even said this in her uh, on the street comments. Um, we know the laws are written by those who are in power. Right. So right. those who are who are who are the ones in power, mm. predominantly male, predominantly white. Right. So they yes. get to write the rules. It's sort of like what's that saying about war? Those who the, the victor gets to write, write the history. Right. So uh, that power uh, that is held by predominantly men and predominantly white men perpetuates the the inequities, the injustices in the system, right? So mm -hmm. they are designed to protect one another. And I was thinking about that just, a, a, I don't know, a few days ago, I was watching a report or reading a report about how it's, there are so many differences in the various states that we have and the counties all have their own, I guess, laws as well. Right. But how 
you can't even get, begin to get to the truth because there are so many layers of protection with written into the laws. And you talk about the body cam uh, footage, right? This has been ridiculous what's happening in North Carolina, in Elizabeth, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, where the you can't even get the body camera footage released that you got to go to a judge someplace to get it released. The, the governor can't even get it released. The, the DA can't, the, the state uh, attorney can't get it released because of a local ordinance that says that only the district, local county prosecutor is the only one with the authority to say, yes, release the video or not release the video. That's crazy, <laughs> in, yeah. in, in my opinion, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that Elizabeth City, North Carolina is where my husband is from. Uh, and the the man who was shot when he was shot, a bullet ricocheted into my my husband's aunt's home. And thankfully, she was not home. And so uh, I say that to say, you know, these things happen everywhere. And I feel like only some of them make the news. But this one, this one especially hit it's like close literally to home. Hit, hit close to home. Yeah. And it really put in perspective. Elizabeth City is, I joke and say that my husband's from the middle of nowhere. It's very, very small. And I'm honestly surprised it did make the news. But even if it hadn't, I would have known about it. And it makes me think how many times does something like this happen that I don't even know about because mm -hmm. it happens in a small place or it's, you know, shoved under the rug or it's, um, just not newsworthy because it's happening so often and how many people are affected that we don't even know, you know? So yeah, I just wanted to yeah. point that out. Miranda, I saw you were going to say something. Oh, um, I, I wasn't, but um, oh, I, can't. Okay. No, I, I think it does happen a lot off, um, more than people think. Even when we think about Cape Cod, I think people don't think about what happens here. Right. I mean, there are, I have talked to a lot of different people, especially um, as we were planning our listening event. And there are stories I have, you know, teenage boys or teenage girls talking to me, you know, teenagers of color saying the police, you know, treated me this way. And, um, you know, I don't want to tell anyone's story, but just like the way that these things happen in one of our, um, in our event as well that we had last year, um, the mother of a young man, she spoke about um, what happened to her son as well. And I think, people don't realize that that stuff does happen even in their own neighborhoods because people don't talk about it. Um, I know recently in the news, there was um, a woman in Hyannis and they did a stop with, um, for, to arrest her teenage son who was in the car and her four and five year olds were in the back as well. And it was, I think it's like, that was one of the very first times I feel like in the news, you actually are hearing about um, these types of issues actually happening in our neighborhood. Do you, do you think, Miranda, that's why people, when you talk to people um, and they say things like, oh, racism has seeped into the criminal justice system. Do you think that's why people on Cape Cod don't think there's there's racism is because we don't we don't talk about it enough? I think that's a big part of it. I think also, obviously, as a, as Cape Cod is on average 92 percent white um, and they don't experience it. Um, you know, they might say like, oh, I have a friend or, you know, and I think that it's hard when I think they don't hear about it as enough, I don't think people of color are given platforms to talk about it enough as well. Um, that's why one of our goals is to be able to give people those platforms if they need it. Um, I do think that's a big part of it. Yeah, thanks. What uh, the, um, just want to touch on the uh, policies and stuff like that. When I was watching the mayor from Boston saying that their domestic abuse policy was 15 years old and you have to think like, why was it 15 years old? Because they don't want to update it because it'll help protect, uh, you know, because the civilian, as and I, what I try to do is for the, the community is, I know the internal works and I know the internal of departments and what they, what the questions you may want to ask your chief or your sheriff that they may feel uncomfortable about. But basically those policies, you, as a, a citizen, you should be able to go to the police station and say, can I get a copy of your standard operation procedure so we can read it? 
and see the dates on there when they've been updated. Because you may see something there from 1997 and here it is 2021 and things have changed, but it's there to protect the officer. They're going to say he follows our procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and you have to have an attorney look at the scan operator, somebody outside of Cape Cod. Because when we got our attorney, we got somebody out of Fairfax in Richmond, a white attorney to represent us in the civil rights case. And he's now representing Lieutenant Karen, the military officer who got sprayed in Windsor. Mm -hmm. So he, our attorney is defending him now. Um, but those are the little things that, like I said, the community, people here in Cape don't believe there's racism that exists here. I was talking to a lieutenant in the Howard's Police Department, and he basically was, I asked him about the gangs. And he basically said, we don't have gangs on Cape Cod. And I'm thinking about, it only takes three people to be a gang with the same purpose and the same colors. <laughs> it doesn't, you have your wannabe guys who want to be Crips and Bloods and MS-13. You got your, you know, you got your real gang member. And it just, it was, it was funny to me that he would say there's no gangs here. But as a tourist place, you don't want to fear, scare away not to come here. And that's, that's the fear of saying, Oh yeah, we do have gangs, and like, well, who's going to come? I mean, they're still going to come, but it's like it's just part of saying no. We, everything is fine, even after the George Floyd case. You didn't get too many comments from any of the, the heads in these departments about what happened. I mean, think about who came out and said, "Yeah, that was terrible." I didn't see too many uh, heads of uh, departments come out and say that was terrible. What happened? Well, I want to give our chief in Florida, in uh, Florida, my goodness, in Dallas, <laughs> uh, some credit uh, because I, I, I think he probably said it publicly, and, uh, but I, I know he said it to me privately mm. when the the when George Floyd was killed over a year ago. I remember Chief Dunn saying to me, uh, "That should never have happened," you know, and. Mm. The women and men of the family police force uh, all are appalled mm -hmm. at, at what we witnessed. And then when the verdict came through and uh, former officer Chauvin was was convicted on three counts, found guilty on three counts, uh, the chief called me again and he said, I'm just checking in with you. He said, because I know, you know this has been a rough year for you and I know this you know, these last couple of days have probably been rough for you. And and so I just want to just check in and see how you're doing. So then I think there is at least a, a head of a department on. on uh, 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 I, I want your viewers to know I back the blue and certain things, but I know inside these departments, they know. We all know who your one to two percent bad apples are, mm. but they don't get rid of them because they can't get rid of them. The unions protect the union. them. Yeah, right. Yes. So now right. the unions have come out and said that they're going to, they've instructed all their members to intervene if they see one of their officers do something. That came out last week. They're going to, mm. it's going to be very hard to get a two year officer to tell a 25 year old officer you're doing something wrong. Right. I, right. Now you become like, who are you? And now you become a target because now you're, you're going to tell me 25 years I'm doing something wrong. Right. So yeah. that's going to be very hard. And I felt like the unions should be paying the lawsuits, not the taxpayers. They should carry the, the insurance policies when, when the towns get sued. They, they want to represent them, then you pay, you pay the money <laughs> if they lose. Rev, I know we need to move on to the second uh, second question, but I wanted to quickly say when George Floyd was murdered last year, we were on a Zoom um, event with Chief Dunn, you, myself, and, and some others, and he did publicly say uh, how he felt about about that. I'm sure he, I think he mentioned that he, he called you as well, but um, mm -hmm. I did want to say that he said that, and I mistakenly referred to um, Officer Chauvin as George Chauvin because that's where my mind was going. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so now I want to go to the to the second question, and 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 that question is, you know, how do we eradicate? So 
we all agree, and I presume most of our viewers uh, agree that racism does exist in the criminal justice system, in our justice system. So how do you eradicate it? How do you get rid of it? So let's take a listen to what uh, our people on the street had to say, and we'll be back with our panel after that. Well, I mean, even look at the United States. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. Right there, it shows something's, you know, something's wacky. It's not, it's not a good place um, when we think about justice. I think the, 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 the way to start fixing it is, is not just one thing, but it's, it's um, you got to do maybe five things or, or, or six things. Um, you got to take a look at the laws. You got to take a look at the policies and the procedures and say, what's broken here? What, how do these uh, laws, how do these regulations, how do these codes benefit the white majority? How do they oppress? Um, uh, people of color? How do they oppress black people? How do they oppress uh, poor people? What, where's the disadvantage? And it's, you, you got to undo, you got to undo the laws. You got to look at what's broken and you have to fix it. You have to look at how our current system benefits wealthy people or benefits this group of people and you have to fix it. But that's not enough because we also know that in the justice system, sometimes, especially in um, trial courts before a judge, um, there there's still a little discretion that's going on on sentencing. For an example, judges have still have a discretion on how much sentencing they give. Uh, that type of change is working on people's hearts. You know, we're we're educating people here in Falmouth. We're educating people. Uh, and, and we're trying to get them to look at history. You know, we're hitting their heads. You got to look at people's hearts, and we got to change people's hearts. I think a good start would probably be to get Congress to uh, to to adopt. Uh, the, the House has already adopted the George Floyd Fairness in Policing uh, Act uh, that will uh, you know, hold the police more accountable. Uh, there will be some data collection uh, so that people can see in real facts and figures where uh, there may be instances of, of police misconduct. Uh, I think looking at the issue of qualified immunity, which uh, you know is a result of a Supreme Court case some years ago, uh, gave police officers a certain level of immunity uh, in enforcing the law and, and not to suggest that police officers don't do a great job and in some instances uh, you know that qualified immunity is uh, uh, is is necessary but I think a, a, a relook at qualified immunity so that it's not used as a uh, uh, as a sword for police officers or, uh, rather than a shield to protect them which was its original uh, original intent I think the key is 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 implementing uh, and continuing uh, these uh, efforts that have been made with, uh, within the past year. And uh, I think that's a start to eradicating it anyway. In addition to the tactical changes, we have to work on the adaptive changes and, and changing how people see others and how they see themselves. And to start to realize that uh, when we have inclusion and diversity and equality for all people, it helps everyone. So we just heard from our people on the street, but before we get into that commentary, I am just burning to know, Robert, you were military police, you said, for six years. Thank you for your service. Thank you. You were um, in the department for 30 years. Yes. And you've talked a lot about the things that you saw and you you sued the department at some point, I, I've got to know, how and why did you stay in for so long? What, what drove you to do it and how did you manage? I had a strong background. My aunt, Eugenia Forts, if you ever drove by Eugenia Forts Beach by the Kennedy compound, she raised me. My grandmother was strong, Cape Verdeans. Um, she was with me till the time she died uh, and encouraged me to 
you know, you, you, you're going to make it do it. And um, I just wasn't going to let them win. Mm. I just wasn't going to let them win and run me out just because I'm black. And that was basically what it was. My friend um, was a Muslim. And those are the two things when you see on the lawsuit, Mr. Shabazz, which I can't say much because he's still working there right now. Um, so I can only talk about myself, basically. Um, but that was my main thing. I, you know, when I first got there, I saw a retirement at 25 years and I was going to get there. I ended up staying 30 just to make 85% more. But mentally, it was very tough. I lived 52 miles away from work one way. So I wouldn't be around them. I drove 110 miles round trip to go to work. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Wow is right. I lived in Frederick, Maryland, which was way out there. And it was a trip. And then I moved a little closer. But I, I just didn't want to be around there. It was, I, when you go to work and you trust the inmates more than you trust the deputies, you know that, <laughs> you know, but I, I was going to make it because of my strong background being raised here. And my aunt was a very tough woman. And until she died, she would call me daily when I was going through things and just reassure me that God was on my side. And uh, my spiritual belief got stronger. And uh, I, I just knew we were going to prevail. And wow. We, and we did. And, um, um, but my, the target never left my back to the day I left there. Cause there were still people there that did stuff to us. They were able to keep their jobs because we were civil service, not union. So it's very hard to get rid of somebody after the, you know, they're vested, you know, it's very hard to get rid of people. So, yeah. but that was my main thing. Right? I, it was just my upbringing and, my aunt being in the civil rights movement all the years, um, her sitting on that beach and a white person there next uh, called the police and wanted her off in 1939. But she sat there till it got dark and wouldn't move. And she always daily tell me stories about, she used to call Cape Cod the upper south. And that's what she mm -hmm. called. Yeah. So, that was basically uh, my anchor right there was her. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. I think Eugenia Forts is a name every Cape Codder should know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, she's a, she's a wonderful woman. She, she, didn't, she didn't care if you were black or white. She, if you were in the right, she was going to help you, you know, so... And she had no children, and me and my sister were her children. So that was, you know, but now that they asked your question there, Ms. Price, she was my anchor. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Miranda, how do you know the name, Eugenia Ford? Well, she's a um, very prominent um, racial justice advocate, um, for, well, historically speaking, here on Cape Cod. I've listened to, um, she has tapes and videos. Um, talking about what it was like when she was growing up here and living here. And um, I know she, I believe she was the founder of Cape Cod NAACP chapter as well. Yes. So I've just, something I've been familiar with. And I, I think if you really want to know what it was, what historically what's happened here on Cape Cod, what Cape Cod's relationship with race is, um, listening to her stories is really important. And she offers some really incredible insight. Wow. Uh, you both have uh, educated me. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for that. Wow. Yeah, let's go to the Zion Museum, see Mr. Reed. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, right. and her, sure. rocking, sure. her rocking chairs in there. There's a rocking yes. chair at the town. Oh, hall. I have seen yeah. that. Okay, yeah. okay. Now it's now it's in context for me. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they got a rocking chair to sit up front. And she always used to tell me, he goes, I had to watch those rich people up there because they always want to get over on the poor people. So I was right up front watching them, and they knew I was watching them. So, so, that was awesome. so let's we're going to spend the the, the remaining uh, time we have to talk a little bit about our uh, second question, which is how do you eradicate uh, racism in the justice system? Maybe one of the ways you eradicate it is you sue them, like Robert did, and uh, you know, and 
won the case. It was a $45 million lawsuit, as I recall, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and uh, your co-defendants or co-plaintiffs and you were able to uh, to uh, be successful in that effort. So, right. Uh, but it, was, one it, was thing cut, it, was, it was cut and dried. We never had to testify. They settled the first day of court in, in Alexandria. And uh, it was just... You know, they they admit everything that we wrote on there happened, but when we, did, but did it did it change anything? Do has has have your colleagues with whom you work there, uh, Mr. Shabazz and our others, did they feel like it made a difference? Well, he's a major now, so that helped. Okay. He was the first black major they ever had, and, and he, he had been he had been fired, right? Had he? Yeah, had been we were both from his position. we were both fired for ten months. The county attorney actually told the sheriff, don't do it. They have First Amendment rights. But an elected official always says, I'll let the taxpayers vote me out or vote me in. I'm going to do this. Compared yeah. to a, a police chief who's appointed, he could be removed daily. But a sheriff who's elected is going to wait to four years and say, I'm going to do all this crazy stuff I'm going to do. And hopefully the, the taxpayers will still vote me in. But he lost. He lost the election uh, right after that. Well, you said something earlier that uh, I think also came up in our persons on the street response to the question. Uh, Bob Mascali talked about uh, qualified immunity. Qualified immunity, a subject that I've been learning again, trying to learn more and more about in the last year or so. Uh, and as I understand it, Robert, you can correct me if I if I'm incorrect about this. That that officers are given some protections um, to keep them from being uh, personally responsible or personally liable for um, conduct uh, in which they have been engaged uh, in the line of duty. So if an officer does something uh, that is uh, improper or illegal uh, mm -hmm. that qualified immunity protects them from being sued and held accountable or brought up on charges for that. Am I, am I right. correct yeah. about that? Yes. Yeah. Basically, they, uh, yeah, the protection, like I said, between the immunity and the unions and this other things. But you're 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 definitely correct on what you just said there, Reverend. That's uh, yeah. So that's something that um, perpetuates the racism that exists, right? Again, right. The, the, you, you feel you can get away with stuff. When you look at Chauvin's face when he's sitting on Floyd, did he have any fear? Did you see any fear in his eye he was going to lose his job? I mean, I mean, it's so sad to see. I mean, just to watch that. But I'm looking at this guy and I've worked with people like him. And I've seen things and I did things myself that probably, you know, ask God to forgive me every day for certain things that I had to do to survive in there. Because police officers always believe I'd rather be tried by 12 than buried by six. And but Shaw, and he's just looking there like, hey, because he's done it before and nothing ever happened. Exactly. Well, that's a certain with my reaction that this this is not new. This is just what I do. You know, this, yeah. this is what I do. This is how I how I police. And you have to look at, he's 20 something years on. He was right. probably trained by somebody who was out of Vietnam. But back in Vietnam, when they came out of Vietnam, people couldn't get jobs. Most of the time they got law enforcement jobs. So you've been in war. All you know is killing and surviving. So he was probably trained by somebody that believed in that type of philosophy. You know, like you, uh -huh. you need to beat down or if you already have the prejudice in you on top of it and you already have mental issues on top of it or a, a drinking or alcohol problem on top of it, it's just more fuel for the fire for somebody like Sean. But he, his face was like, I do this every day. So right. and I guess know it. <laughs> Well, I guess then it's come out since the verdicts that, uh, mm -hmm. yes, he has done that over, right. over the years. Uh, so, Miranda, we've we got only a couple of minutes left, but I want to give you a chance to respond to the question of 
how do you think we can eradicate racism in our injustice system? Yeah, I think that's a really hard question. I mean, talking about, you know, policing, right? Um, as Robert said, there's a, a pattern of police officers getting away with this type of stuff. I think the issue for me, there are two, I guess, but one of them is about bias and the way that, again, we have designed the system. So there are multiple levels to the injustice system. You have um, police officers, then you have the courts, you have juries, you have judges. And at each moment, we ask people to make decisions, to make judgments. And oftentimes they're not allowed to, you know, they're not able to always make them consciously or they're making them with an unconscious bias. So I think it's, how do you eradicate racism is really how do you eradicate bias? You can, you take it out systemically? Well, then you're totally reforming the entire system. I mean, you have to take that choice away from people, I guess, in that way. And that's, the whole system is predicated on giving people the choice to choose what happens to other people. So it's, it's a very complicated um, question, I think, in general. Um, and I think as we also, you know, I mentioned this seeping out of racism from the justice system. I don't think you can fully eradicate the racism within the justice system without dealing with that as well. I think we really need to make sure that people have mental health benefits and resources that can help build them up after what they go through when they're through going through the uh, justice system. I, yeah, I think the key there is rebuilding the system because yeah. yeah, how do you how do you fix so many so many broken pipes, so many broken how do you fix so much that's broken and along the way and where every level is based on the level before it? It's you wouldn't do that with a house. You wouldn't say like, oh, we'll fix the pipes in the house, but not fix also the roof and fix the walls. It's, it's all got to work. You got to do it all together. And, and in that case, you just build a new house, push it over and build a new one and might be what we need to do with our system. Yeah, it's going to take a great political will to do it. But yeah. you, as you see all over the country right now, even at the Capitol Police after the insurgent, um, I think it's over 200 officers are left already. Seattle's had over 172 officers leave. Their chief was a black female. She's one of the few in the whole country. They wanted her to take a 20% pay cut. She left. So what happens is now you lose all these officers and now these departments and the overtime problem, they're going to go into the pile of applicants they would not hire in the first place. But now they have to go in that pile and hopefully pull out some of these individuals they didn't want to hire because the overtime, the county say you're spending too much. Our department used to spend like $8 million a year just in overtime. And then they finally told me, you got to start hiring people. And they started hiring people they, they didn't want to hire. And hopefully they didn't do anything bad. So now these are the bad apples get in. Because now they're in that pile that they get a waiver and they get in the department. They might have had a felony. They might have different things. And they waived it because the pressure of the political thing is saying, we can't spend any more money, you know, you guys, but you have to look around the country and they say all these, see all these officers that are leaving, retiring, and, and it's going to really, you think you have bad apples now, wait to the ones they really hire. Oh, back to, very, very encouraging. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, goes, it goes back to Miranda's point very early on about how capitalism is also built into this. Oh, uh, yeah. Start talking yeah. about the money, but right. I I know we're, we we got to wrap it up. I can keep going. I'm gonna pass it back to Rev. Yeah. Hey, what did it say? Follow the money. Follow the money. Follow money the, money. Is the, the root of all evil. Uh, Jerry Maguire, show me the uh, money. Somebody uh, made a song about that. Money, <laughs> money, money. Mm. <laughs> hey, uh, well, let me. I'll close with just echoing what um, Reverend Nell said in her response to you know how do we eradicate it. And, and if I'm remembering correctly, she said, well, it's not just one thing, it's five or six things that have to be done, right? It's sort of like what you were saying, Anji, you can't just fix the plumbing, you gotta fix the walls, you gotta fix the roof, the, you know, all all the components of the house, and maybe you gotta bulldoze a thing and just start over. Mm -hmm. But the other thing she said is that uh, there has to be a transformation of uh, what's on people's hearts. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, as a person of faith, uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm going to be preaching. 
And that's what I'm going to be teaching is that we've got to get people to uh, change what's on their hearts. And if we can do that, then uh, all things are possible. So let me thank uh, Miranda Alves for uh, you are being with us today and wish you only the best with uh, Cape Cod Voices. Uh, stay strong in the struggle and the work in which your sister and you and others are involved. Engage. Robert Cutts, uh, you, you are a person to be um, celebrated and uh, acknowledged. Uh, and uh, we feel grateful for your having spent time with us this afternoon as well. Thank you, and of course, Of course, uh, always delight to be with... Uh, the co-hostess with the mostess, uh, something like that, the Honorable Angela Scott Price. Um, thank you for being the co-host. And thanks to uh, Deb and Alan behind the scenes at FCTV for all you do to uh, bring this uh, important conversation to, uh, to the people of Falmouth and beyond. So that's it. Until the next time, be safe.